Delta was a name worn by two cars very important to the history of rally. The first was a Group B monster. In its day, probably the fastest rally car that had ever been made, and it brought the sport to its knees, arguably acting as the impetus for ending the Group B class in 1986. Its Group A successor not only seized the torch of performance, but used it to satellite every rally stage on the continent and beyond, over and over and over again. This is the story of Lancia's famous and infamous Delta Rally cars, brought to you by Car Vertical. In 1983, Lancia had reclaimed their place at the very top of rally. Having set Europe's rally stages alight through the 60s and 70s with the plucky Fulvia and the electrifying Stratos, Lancia had staged a comeback celebrating a remarkable victory in what was just the very beginning of the Group B era. But the winning 037, for all of its success, was flawed, and it was easy to see. As innovative a design as the 037 was, and it was with its tubular steel space frame chassis, Kevlar composite body panels and mid-mounted engine, it was fundamentally outdated in one major way. It was rear-wheel drive only, and technical staff at Lancia had been crying out to senior leadership at Fiat to give them the funding to make the last rear-wheel drive World Rally Champion four-wheel drive to properly keep up with its rivals. They weren't being listened to, at least initially. 1984, therefore, was unsurprisingly a disappointing year for Lancia who despite pulling out all the stops and unveiling a new EVO 2 variant of the 037, simply could not develop the concept any further. The suits were now finally convinced of what Lancia's engineers had been saying for months, they needed a four-wheel drive car. But they weren't just going to chuck another transfer case into the 037, that would be too simple. They were going to design an entirely new car an unbeatable rally beast the likes of Peugeot and Audi could only dream of beating. They were going to build a titan of tarmac, a god of gravel, a monument to speed in the image of the Lancia Delta. Having the new car be based around the Delta was I believe, probably, the company's corporate brain trying to justify to itself the enormous expense of the undertaking they were taking on. The thinking was that having a successful rally program with a car that had a similar shape and shared a name with the company's family hatchback offering would increase sales. After all, what wins on Sunday sells on Monday, right? Or at least that's what they told the accounting department. If you're in the market for a larger of your own, or any car for that matter, you'll want to check out Car Vertical. Take this Epsilon, remarkably badged as a Lancia in some markets. When listed for sale, it would appear as Category S, but what does that really mean? It can be hard to know, but Car Vertical can show you that hidden history. Looks like this Epsilon had a bit more than a fender bender. Using data from national registries, insurance companies, maintenance databases, and more, Car Vertical can show you the hidden history of your car. Avoid dishonest dealers and unexpected costs by going to the link in the description for 10% off, or you can use the discount code AUTOMOBILISTIC. Thanks to Car Vertical for supporting the channel, and now, back to the video. The road going Lancia Delta was not all that much to write home about, really. It started life in 1979 as the smallest sibling to Lancia's Big Beta. Most of the reason we think the Delta is cool today is undoubtedly a result of the rally effort. So I guess in that way, the marketing team were really onto something. This video isn't about the road car, and nor does it need to be. As you'll see, the burgeoning Group B project car was only tangentially related to the road car anyway. But there is one thing that you need to remember about the road car, and that's that in 1986, Lancia unveiled the Delta HF four-wheel drive in Turin. It had 163 brake horsepower from a two-liter engine, and crucially, was four-wheel drive. But back to 1984 now. The successor to the 037 finally had a name. It was called the Delta S4, meaning supercharged and four-wheel drive. 
They took what they'd learned from the briefly successful 037 and built the car around a steel tubular space frame chassis, used Kevlar composite body panels and mounted the engine in the middle behind the crew. Beyond that, a lot was changed. The engine was supercharged, as I said, but it was also turbocharged. This twin charging was supposed to increase peak power output, but also broaden the power band across the entire rev range. A rev range that was truly enormous. The engineers at Abarth, a Lancia and Abarth were both owned by Fiat at this point, had created a 1,759cc four-cylinder engine capable of revving up to 10,000 RPM. The stated peak power output figure was 450 brake horsepower, though it's believed that the actual figure was maybe up to 100 brake horsepower more than this. The engine displacement, once multiplied by 1.4 per the FISA regulations regarding forced induction, placed the new Delta S4 into the 2 to 2.5 litre class which had a minimum weight of 890 kilograms. Now, Lancia had added quite a lot of weight with their new four-wheel drive system, and were now looking for any way possible to save as much as possible. They did this everywhere, thinning the tubes of the space frame chassis, creating thinner and thinner Kevlar composite body panels to clad what was effectively just a silhouette at this point. And eventually, they ditched things like skid plates altogether. They just got rid of them, and they replaced all the windows with polycarbonate. This extreme weight saving proved overzealous in testing. When the car basically just fell apart, it was too weak to hold itself together. This resulted in important strengthening work needing doing to multiple points on the chassis. This resulted in a 950 kilogram weight for tarmac events and a 1050 kilogram weight for dirt events. To claim this thinly veiled silhouette racer was at all related to the Delta road car was hilarious. But as per the Group B regulations, the car did need to be related to a road car. So, they did what everyone else had been doing, and what Lancia themselves had done with the 037, and made a homologation special. The Delta S4 Stradale, meaning street, was pretty much what you'd expect from a box-ticking exercise meant only to homologate one of the wildest rally cars ever made. It was the same car, with some sound deadening and some Alcantara to make it feel like you weren't in a steel-reinforced Tupperware box, and actual glass for windows, which was actually not a quality of life thing and uh, was just to save money. Though in an act of true thoughtfulness, they did at least give you air conditioning, though the jury is still out on whether or not that actually counteracted the heat from the engine, let alone the weather. The Group B rule set stated that at least 200 of these road homologated cars had to be built, but what's racing without loopholes? And the Group B rules had a big one. I won't go into it in too much detail, but basically there was a loophole in the evolution rules that meant Lancia didn't have to build anywhere near that. The estimates vary quite widely on how many they actually built. The low end says 45, the high end says 150. Either way you go, it's less than 200. But most of these were apparently converted into race cars pretty soon after production anyway, so it's not actually known how many surviving actual Stradales are out there probably not very many. Before the Delta S4 was homologated for competition, Lancia continued to run the 037. Unsurprisingly, the car wasn't a front runner. At the Tour de Course in 1985, tragedy struck the team and the sport. Lancia driver Attilio Bottega crashed his 037 into a tree. Luckily, his co-driver escaped unharmed, but Bottega was killed instantly. Questions were beginning to be asked around the safety of these cars, but nobody stopped to answer them. The Delta S4 was homologated for the final race of the 1985 season. At the RAC rally in Wales, larger driver Henry Toivonen took victory, and Marco Allen, driving a second Delta S4, took second place as well. Peugeot won the Constructors' Championship that year, and Peugeot driver Timo Salonen took the Drivers' Championship, but with Lancia claiming a 1-2 on their new car's debut, all eyes were on the Lancia Delta S4 going into 1986.
Toivonen won the opening round in Monte Carlo, cementing himself and the Delta S4 as frontrunners in the championship. Peugeot were hot on their heels, winning round two, after Toivonen's S4 suffered an engine failure. Marco Allen in the other Delta S4 took second place. The following event was the Portuguese Rally. For those of you who know about Group B history at all, you'll know what that means. And for those of you who don't, it's bleak. The driver of a competing Ford RS200 lost control of his car entering a bend. Now, you'll have seen from Group B footage, both in this video and others, I'm sure, that rally crowds at the time had a propensity for closeness to the track. Undoubtedly, this was a thrilling spectator experience, but everyone involved, especially, and I, I cannot stress this enough, especially event organizers, should have known better. The car barreled into the crowd. Three people were killed, and more than 30 more were injured. This marked one of the sport's darkest ever days. All of the factory drivers on the grid pulled out immediately. Some of the privateer teams continued to compete. One of them was running a Renault 5 Maxi Turbo, and they won. Following the horrendous accident in Portugal, it could be argued that the writing was already on the wall for Group B as a class. But the show went on, and the rally moved to Kenya. The Safari Rally was known to be so tough on the cars that Lancia didn't trust the Delta S4 to stay alive. So they fielded the older 037 Evo instead. Unsurprisingly, the slower, older car didn't win. Marco Allen pulled off a pretty impressive third place finish for Lancia in the old 037, while Toyota's Celica took first and second place. The following round was the famous Tour de Course in France, a thousand kilometers of twisting, winding tarmac over just 24 stages. Lancia were the favorites to win. They clearly had the most technologically advanced car, and their car was clearly the fastest. But it wasn't without its problems. As I mentioned before, Lancia chose not to run the S4 at the more punishing events because the car had a tendency to, well, fall apart. The weight saving measures had been so extreme that over the distance of a rally, the car would suffer serious damage and would often need serious structural repairs doing between events. One of the scarier reported faults is that the composite floor behind the accelerator pedal could crack, and sometimes the accelerator pedal would get stuck. The morning of the rally, star driver Henry Toivonen reported not feeling very well. He insisted that he was well enough to race, and he climbed into the car with co-driver Sergio Cresto. Toivonen's stage times were blisteringly fast. They were well on track to winning the rally, until it happened. Spectators and marshals were waiting at the end of a stage to see the championship hopefuls, but they didn't show up. A few minutes went by and it became clear that something was wrong. They sent out a search party to look for them. This stage of the Tour de Course was characterized by narrow roads and steep drops, with much of it outside of the view of spectators and marshals. The driver, co-driver and car were alone. The search party found the car, smouldering in a ravine. Going around a tight left-hand corner, the car had left the road and rolled over a low stone wall. Some spectators, looking from afar, claim to have heard an explosion and seen a fireball. And there is video that supposedly captures this same fireball. What we know for sure is that the car caught fire and both occupants perished at the scene. What was recovered was barely more than a twisted chassis, with the vast majority of the composite bodywork gone too in the inferno. It's believed that the car, which had been caught by a tree as it was tumbling down into the ravine, had suffered a punctured fuel tank. The Delta S4's fuel tank was, like every other component of the car, made very thin to save as much weight as possible. Not only that, but it was mounted partially below the seats, and if you remember, they ditched the skid plates to save weight too. 
It was very thin, it was unprotected, it was under the driver's seat, and it was punctured by a tree branch spilling fuel onto hot componentry. It's not known exactly what caused the accident that led to the deaths of Henry Teubenen and Sergio Cresto that day, but the reaction was immediate. The sports governing body, FISA, immediately announced a development freeze across all of Group B, and it was quickly decided that from 1987, the Group B class would be no more, and the class unceremoniously disbanded. It had been known since 1985 that FISA was potentially looking to replace the Group B class with a more prototype-esque class for 1988. Dubbed Group S, many of the established Group B manufacturers were already hard at work creating the perfect Group S car, which would require only 10 examples for homologation. Lancia's take, called the ECV, was a complete overhaul of the entire idea of a rally car. It boasted a carbon fiber and aluminium honeycomb chassis, totally revised aerodynamics, a twin turbo 1.8 liter four cylinder engine, and would be one of the first rally oriented cars to be designed at least partially in computer aided design software. However, along with the end of Group B, FISA announced that Group S would not go ahead. The solution to the tragedies that unfolded under the Group B rule set was definitely not to be found in increased manufacturer freedom and even faster cars. Thus marked the beginning of Rally's next era. Group A. The Group A regulations marked a significant shift away from the days of ever increasing power and homologation specials to justify it. Group A was much stricter on power, weight, and road car DNA. While a Group B car had to be similar to a road car of which at least 200 examples had been built, if that, a Group A car had to be based on a car of which at least 5,000 examples had been built, later reduced to 2,500, and different championships interpreted these rules in different ways, and the exact numbers vary by specific championship. They modified the generic rule set. But to cut a very long story short, all of the manufacturers were caught a little bit off guard by this shift, and they were sent scrambling to look for a car in their lineup that was good enough to go rallying with. Lancia, however, didn't have to look very hard. Remember earlier when I asked you to remember that Delta road car? This is where it becomes important again. That road car was a pretty powerful four-wheel drive hatchback. That's exactly what they needed. By dumb luck, Lancia were already making the perfect car, and this would pay big dividends for them. They basically took the Lancia Delta HF four-wheel drive, slapped delivery on it, put some off-road tires on it, and hey presto, the Lancia Delta HF four-wheel drive Group A rally car was born and ready to go. Their biggest competition was, perhaps unsurprisingly, Audi who threw Hanu Mikler and Volta Roll into Audi 200s and set them loose. That campaign went so well that Audi left the sport. That's not entirely fair, they came a respectable, albeit distant, second place in 1987, and they did manage a mighty 1-2 finish at the Safari Rally, but it wasn't good enough for them to have a second go though. Lancia won pretty effortlessly in 1987, with the rest of the field consisting of a Renault 11 Turbo, a pretty lethargic Mazda 323, a Volkswagen Golf, and some German saloon cars. Lancia driver Juha Kankkonen won the Drivers' Championship too, before leaving the team for Toyota. Lancia started off strong in 1988, winning the first two events before wheeling out an updated version of the Delta. It now had bigger brakes and bigger wheels to accommodate, and upgraded suspension to compensate, and some more power, because, you know, why not, I guess? The new improved Delta got a new improved badge as well. It was now called the Delta HF Integrale. Marco Allen's car promptly suffered a transmission failure at the following event, probably to do with the increased power. Luckily for Lancia, one of their other cars, driven by Massimo Biazion, held strong and took victory in the event. After the transmission failure, the team replaced the transmission with a new, upgraded six-speed version. The team went on to dominate this season, 
winning 10 out of 11 events, only losing one rally to Ford in Corsica. Massimo Biasion won the Drivers' Championship too. Lancia had capitalised well on an unforeseen first mover advantage, but with other manufacturers now having had two years to catch up, how long could Lancia really hold on to their advantage? And if they were going to slip behind, who was going to take their place? Toyota's Celica GT4 had proven fast at times in 1988, but was plagued by reliability problems. Despite a strong driver lineup consisting of Juha Kankkonen, Kenneth Eriksson, and rising rally star Carlos Sainz, 1989 started in familiar fashion for them, suffering multiple mechanical failures early in the season. This was great news for Lancia though, who pulled a massive lead early in the championship, scoring six consecutive wins, ignoring Sweden and New Zealand, which didn't count towards championship points. Those two, by the way, were won by Mazda, partly thanks to the fact that a lot of the big factory teams didn't contest the ones that didn't count. The last of this run, the Argentinian rally, was won by Mikel Eriksson, who for the next event, moved to Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi had been having a tough time beating their Galant VR4 into race-winning shape, but after months of hard work and with Eriksson at the wheel, they managed their first win. Given the domination that Lancia had shown for the last two and a half years, this was surely just a blip, right? Well, the next rally in Australia was won by a resurgent Toyota. Perhaps Lancia's grip on the top spot really was beginning to slip. God forbid they'd actually have to fight for it. Lancia won the following round in the hands of Massimo Miki Biazion, having upgraded the engine from 8 valves to 16. With that, the championship was sewn up. Lancia had won their third consecutive manufacturer's championship, and Miki Biazion took the driver's championship too. They didn't even bother turning up to the final round in Wales. But now with Toyota and potentially Mitsubishi too hot on their heels, Lancia needed to be proactive. So were they? In a word, no, they weren't. The HF Integrale 16V that they had introduced to the Italian rally in 1989 would be the car that they contested the entire 1990 season with. And while it was an exceptionally capable machine, proven by the fact they actually won a fourth Constructors' Championship with the car, the gap to Toyota had shrunk massively. So much so that Toyota driver Carlos Sainz won a surprise Drivers' Championship that year, snatching it away from the larger team whose wins were spread thin over three drivers. By 1991, the competition was fierce. After Sainz's surprise Drivers' Championship victory in 1990, speculation was rife that Lancia really had slipped, and now it was Toyota's time to take the crown. Both manufacturers, and others too looking for a shot at championship victory, were now reportedly spending whatever it would take to win shoveling seemingly endless supplies of cash into finding creative ways of extracting more speed. Allegedly. There was one rule that had clearly gone out the window though, and that was power. These cars were supposed to be running around about 300 horsepower, but as believed by this point, most of the top teams were running closer to 400. Despite speculation, Lancia fought hard in 1991, and did manage to secure a record fifth consecutive manufacturer's championship. And Lancia driver Juha Kankkonen, who had returned to the team, took the driver's championship too, though only by a hair, as Carlos Sainz had suffered an engine failure at the final round. While all this was unfolding, however, Lancia was developing something truly special. It would be the Delta's final form. Stiffer, stronger, more aerodynamic, more power. The Integrale Evoluzione would carry Lancia's high hopes into 1992. Toyota hadn't been idle though, developing what can only really be described as a completely new car for 1992 with their infinite budget. A move that had once again prompted speculation as to whether or not Lancia's tenure at the top of the point sheet could really last another year. It did. Lancia won again 
in 1992, marking a remarkable six consecutive WRC manufacturers titles. I can only imagine the blood pressure readings at Toyota after that result came in. It wasn't a total loss for Toyota though. Toyota driver Carlos Sainz claimed his second driver's championship in 1992 after Lancia suffered a plethora of issues in the final round. At the end of the 1992 season, Lancia announced the wildly successful Lancia Martini factory rally effort was going to be shut down and the factory would back a private outfit called Jolly Club. It was the end of an era, but Lancia couldn't have gotten the timing better. It was only a matter of time before someone else managed to dethrone Lancia. Why give them the satisfaction? Lancia had nothing to prove, and while Jolly Club never enjoyed the same success as Lancia Martini, it didn't matter. Lancia were already the most decorated manufacturer in the sport by a huge margin. An accolade that the mark holds to this day, with 11 WRC titles. Second place, Citroën. A story for the ages in and of itself, and one that you can hear all about here. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching, and until next time, goodbye.